Well, it's with great pleasure that we welcome everybody here today. This is a wonderful occasion, especially welcoming uh, Peter and Jeanette and Angel and Caleb as our special guests, but also welcoming everyone of European, Asian, African descent, because wherever we trace our roots, we're part of this amazing interconnected web that makes up life on this wonderful, beautiful Earth. So thank you for being part of this and for this energy and for this creation of this world. We also remember and acknowledge that we're meeting on traditional Seneca homelands and we're honored to work with Seneca people and with everyone to help create a world in which we can care for ourselves and each other and the earth and in which we can look at the past with as clear eyes as we have in order to make a way for a future that we'd all like to live in, for a world that respects us all. Um, we'd like to remember before we begin formally, there are two people affiliated with the 1860 meeting house who died this year. One was Peter Evans, who's a long-term board member from Wayne County and who has been so helpful at connecting us with so many things. The other one is Margaret Hartsog, who was the town historian for Farmington for years and years and years. And when we first started, when the building was, some of you may remember, was over there about to fall down, Margaret came and gave a talk, and she never flinched. And that's really something we appreciate in her. So thank you for remembering those two people and their families today. Um, this. Um, as most of you know, we're involved with restoring the building across the street. We met with two contractors that will, we hope will bid on restoring the roof. So stay tuned and keep yourselves posted. Um, we're restoring that building not because it's an old, it was an old barn about to fall down, but because it represents a national site of conscience. It represents respect for people everywhere, including especially Haudenosaunee people, African Americans and women, because those were the three people that this group historically was involved with in the 19th century. And so we do programming every year that relates to equal rights, past and present, with a special focus on those groups. And we're um, very pleased as part of our mission to begin this program today with Jeanette uh, Jemison and Peter Jemison and their family. And we're talking about um, an, an event that uh, uh, kind of commemorates, this is the 183rd anniversary of a council that was held in that 1816 meeting house July 17th through 19th at the request of Tonawanda Seneca, who brought Seneca leaders together with Quaker leaders from Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Genesee yearly meetings of friends to try to devise a strategy to resist the Treaty of Buffalo Creek by which the federal government hopefully, they hope to move as they've done with the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears, all Haudenosaunee people west of the Mississippi. Thanks to Tonawanda organizing and Quaker organizing and other people out, especially in this region, outraged at that thought. There was a supplemental treaty. They were not terribly successful. They kept Allegheny and Cattaraugus. They lost Buffalo Creek and Tonawanda. But Tonawanda Seneca's negotiated a separate deal in 1857, so they still got about a third of their historic reservation, quote unquote. So we commemorate that today, um, and thank you all for being here. We're going to have other programs July 15th, uh, open house with the Ontario County Garden Club tour. So come and join, take a walk on our nature tour. Um, we're going to have August 26th with the Quaba and the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative, a program on um, black education in Rochester. And then in the Macedon Academy with the Historical Society, we're going to have a talk on the Edmondson sisters who escaped from slavery in 1850, came right, well, actually 1848, but they came right to Farmington, where five Quaker women set up a school for them. And it's got national implications, and it's a very dramatic story. So come to any or all of these. Um, yeah, Macedon Historical right, right. Society, yeah. 
So we're very pleased to begin our 2023 season today with um, uh, an honor for Peter Jemison and Jeanette Jemison and a talk by Jeanette and Kaylin and Angel. We are sponsoring this with help from the Committee on Indian Affairs at New York Yearly Meeting and the Earth Care Committee of Rochester Monthly Meeting who are helping us support today's program. So we thank them immensely and profusely. Could not do this without you. Um, Maddie Schmidt is going to do the official presentation of an award we have for Peter and Jeanette. It's called the Carrying on the Vision Award. It's only the third time we've ever given this and we are so so happy you could be here to accept it today. I'll turn the program over to Maddie. I'm going to read this because I thought a lot about what I wanted to say and I don't, I want to make sure that what I said is what I meant to say. <laughs> It is a deep privilege to speak about the background for this award for the 1816, <clears throat> from the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum Board and why this is a joint award. The Museum Board, as Judy has said, is a group dedicated to the education of the public about the historic and enduring rights of indigenous persons, African Americans, and women. All disenfranchised groups championed by now famous speakers who came to the historic building being reconstructed across the road as a place where voices for those rights could be heard in a supportive environment. A place where championing those rights remain relevant to the present day. Peter and Jeanette Jemison are indigenous honorees and carriers of an indigenous vision entwined with the historic meeting house's history, live out the deep spiritual and ethical values of their Haudenosaunee culture in both their personal and professional lives. In fact, I do not believe that for them there is such a division in life experience. They live consistently in all their relations out of their core cultural values. They are Mohawk and Seneca in their persons capturing both the eastern and western doors of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which continues to operate through the Confederacy Council of Chiefs and the Clan Mothers through processes often unrecognized as inspiration for the U.S. government in many aspects. From a Western sensibility, we might say that Peter and Jeanette are models for excellent teamwork and profound collaboration. They have functioned as individuals in their respective roles and responsibilities for Ganondagan, leading the state site and volunteer friends, both critical to Ganondagan's success. This parallels how they function as a family, each with equal and respected roles within the Confederacy and they have collaborated around a compelling vision focused on the presence of Native Americans in New York State prior to European colonization and continuing to the present day. Modeled by Peter and Jeanette's collaborative efforts have been deeply re realized in the Seneca Art and Culture Center, which provides a home for integrative programming between the state site and the Friends. We honor this visionary teamwork and collaboration modeled by Jeanette and Peter over many years by jointly recognizing them for their efforts through the historic site at Ganondagan, the Friends of Ganondagan, and the creation of the Seneca Arts and Culture Center, where all can explore, celebrate, and share the rich and ever-evolving Seneca and Haudenosaunee culture and history. The power of their vision has impacted our region, New York State, the U.S., and the world. There is no better example of the reach of their work than to point to the current exhibition at the Seneca Arts and Culture Center, Wampum Otkoa. Otkoa. Oh, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> With historic wampum objects on display from the Rochester <clears throat> Museum and Science Center to the Musée de Quiet. Brandley in Paris, France, 
and inclusive of contemporary Haudenosaunee artists. Part of the exhibit description reads, wampum yearns to be understood. It heals, protects, beautifies, and confirms relationships. Here at Ganondagan, wampum will be given that opportunity once again. I would like to close this award background with some words from the Tahodaho chief, Leon Shenandoah, whose words endure beyond his mortal life and capture the essence of what binds us in, and this is Haudenosaunee, minds as one. The words come from to become a human being, the message of Tahodaho chief, Leon Shenandoah, um, authored by Steve Wall, who spent many, many years close to Leon Shenandoah, Hampton Roads Publishing Company, 2001. Leon Shenandoah said, there is no security other than in the spiritual. No one can separate himself from the spiritual because nobody can take the creator out of himself. It's always there trying to guide us. If we don't listen all the time, we head for trouble. It's important that we recognize we are spiritual people. Once we do that, it's easier to start listening. The Creator likes to talk to us. Join me in expressing appreciation for the work and examples of Jeanette Jemison, Mohawk, Snipe Clan, and Peter Jemison, Seneca, Heron Clan this year's recipients of the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum's Carrying On the Vision Award, and the opportunity following to listen to the words of Jeanette, as well as Angel and Kaylin, two now young adults who, as children, grew up in their loving care. Pete and Jeanette, would you come up? on the vision proudly presented to Peter Jemison, Seneca Heron Clan, and Jeanette Jemison, Mohawk Snipe Clan, with deep gratitude for your efforts to the Seneca Art and Culture Center at Ganondagan and the Friends of Ganondagan to explore, celebrate, and share the rich and ever-evolving Seneca and Haudenosaunee culture and history, given with affection by the board of the 1816 Farmington Quaker House Museum, June 10, 2023. Thank you very much. Well, and um, we tried to um, specifically choose some pictures that might be meaningful to the historic time. Okay. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> So now I have the privilege of introducing Jeanette for her words. <clears throat> Jeanette Jemison is a member of the Snipe Clan of the Akwesasne Mohawk Reservation. Her 20 years of experience as personnel manager and retail general office manager for Sears proved to be an excellent foundation for her role as Friends of Ganondagan's founding executive director. In this role for 25 years, Jeanette was additionally responsible for cultural programming, events, and community collaborations. In July 2013, she stepped aside to a new executive director, assuming the role of program director, focusing on Haudenosaunee and indigenous programming and select collaborations. And I know that for a period of time, Jeanette served as both executive director and program director. Um, Jeanette has been instrumental in the development of innovative and transformative <laughs> cultural programs for Ganondagan and profound community collaborations. Her leadership encompasses collaborating with Haudenosaunee and other indigenous communities, local and regional organizations, and numerous volunteers in program implementation and community building. <coughs> Additionally, Jeanette has been a powerful advocate for Haudenosaunee artists, culture bearers, and youth. 
Angel Jimerson, Seneca Heron Clan, and Kaylin Fontenelle, also Seneca Heron Clan, were among the first Seneca children to grow up at Ganondigan, historically a thriving Seneca village, in more than 300 years. Throughout their childhoods, Angel and Kaylin were immersed in Haudenosaunee cultural teachings, traditions and values, living with both their uncle, Peter Jemison, and their Ganondigan State Historic Site Manager, artist and historian, and Aunt Jeanette Miller Jemison, Mohawk Snug Clan, Friends of Ganondigan Program Director. Throughout their youth and continuing today, Angel and Kaylin actively participate in ongoing Haudenosaunee cultural programming and events. Currently, Angel fills the role of Iroquois White Corn Project Production Manager. His passion for minimalism, sustainability, and food serenity are a direct reflection of the Haudenosaunee values, cultures, and traditions. Kaylin is a cultural interpreter for Ganondigan State Historic Site, leading tours and school groups while sharing Seneca history, culture, and contemporary life. Kaylin is an avid photographer and weightlifter. Please welcome our speakers with your open minds and hearts. Good morning, everyone. Um, when I was asked by Maddie to speak um, historically, this is not my gig. <laughs> you know? So I used to, as executive director, have to um, go out and speak on different occasions, which I did because I had to do it. And once we had a new executive director and we had people around the site that could do this speaking part and much better than I. Um, I decided to step back and just do what I do best, which is, I think, the programming part. And um, so when Maddie brought it to my attention and asked me, and I, she said, I know you're going to say no, <laughs> but I have this whole thing that you might be comfortable with, you know, and it was talking about, you know, the youth that have grown up at Ganondigan, and also, you know, just some ways that I made some, did some creativity on my own, which is uh, coming up with a book for them. And um, so I agreed to it, and I just said, okay, you know, I'll do it, and, <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> so, lucky you, this is a historic occasion because yes. I'm here. I thought that, like, how was I even going to begin this? Because the book part could probably take about 10 minutes, you know. But um, I thought about it overnight, and I thought, you know, there is so much more to what we did at Ganond again that was behind the scenes, and which was that we opened up that brick house um, where Pete and I lived um, for 30 four years, 35 years, yep. until he retired. And, um, and during that time, we had probably about 18 youth, uh, mostly Seneca um, or Mohawk, that had come to live with us. Some of them five at a time, some of them um, uh, mostly males, I have to say. <laughs> and, and, but most of them were teenagers or over. So you would think that I would be completely gray by this point. <laughs> but um, luckily I have inherited my father's genes with the hair color, and, and um, I was able to fare that. And so what happened was that um, we did never, we never intended to take any youth in. What we, what happened was that our son Ansley was heading off to prep school and um, we happened to have an elders gathering camp um, at Ganondigan. And um, during that camp, which was in August, we had um, a, a talking circle. And next thing you know, Ansley and Pete and our other, um, the eldest stepson, Brendan, 
um, came to me and said, there's a, a young guy that really wants to um, change his life. And honestly, he was from the streets of Buffalo, and it was, it was a pretty rough situation. And so I said, well, we can't just, you know, let him in here. You know, I want to talk to him, see how he's doing, you know, and, you know, where he's at. And because I wanted to make sure that he had compassion in his eyes, first of all. If there's no compassion, there's no getting in our house, you know. So um, I sat and I talked with him, and then we talked again and said we could open up our house to him. Uh, if he wanted, but he had to go by, by our rules, which was no smoking, no drinking, no drugs. He had to do his best, and um, and he came to live with us. He agreed to it, and his mother in Buffalo agreed to it. But you know, it was really strange because it was the easiest transfer ever, because I don't even remember getting a letter from his mother or any legal thing, and I was able to put him into the Victor School District, and um, and maybe we had one letter from her or something, I don't know, but um, I kept telling them that it was Indian Child Welfare Act that would have them put him in that school, and it was for his best, you know, his best interest, and it did, it did happen. And um, he stayed with us for quite a while, and I have to say that he's still in contact with us. He lives in Buffalo right now, and it wasn't an easy journey by any means. And that he lives in Canada right now. What's it? He lives in Canada. Oh yeah, he lives in Canada right now, <coughs> and he's um, and he's actually working in the prisons with um, native prisoners there, and he actually loves it. And um, but like I said, that it was. Um, it was tough times, you know, for him early on, and it was rough for us to get him through, and he made it, and that's where he is today. Um, so when others started to come and live with us, um, as it turned out, it was, um, it was, we call her Goody, Goody and Angel, and Angel was five months old, came to our house, and, um, and they actually, it was supposed to be about Seneca language and immersion program. But what happened was that it ended up being not about that, but about offering a space to live and uh, food and, you know, all of that, stability. And, um, and their mom now has a P, uh, master's degree and is living in Rochester, and Angel and Kaylin, you heard, are um, working at Ganond again, and you know, um, we just kind of, they, they are the ones that have lived with us the longest. Um, we've had other ones short term. Um, when Angel and Kaylin were little, um, I used to go into the, the bedroom and I would tell them stories, and I wouldn't want to have the book a book open because with the light on, then they wouldn't go to sleep. <laughs> so I started to make stories up, and um, a lot of them were um, so that it would put their mind at ease. So it was about fairies and colors and all of that kind of stuff. So that I hope that that's where their mind and their brain would take them during their sleep into a more joyful sleep. And um, so, and one of the stories that I used to tell them was to comfort them and also make them, um, make it easier for them to go off into the woods. And so, and having that connection with the natural world, and that was um, that they would go out there and walk and they would meet these animals out there and they were able to communicate with them only because they had respect for the animals and respect for the birds and all the different creatures out there. So, but they were the only two that had that respect and still could do that. Um, no one else could do that because the rest of us, our minds were still out in society and watching television and, you know, just kind of corrupt minds. So I just kind of felt that it was important that that's where that connection came from. 
Um, the, the book, which is this one, and it's Angel and Kaylin and their four-legged friends. Um, it started off that it was just the story. And then Angel asked me, can you make it into a book? And then I was like, uh, okay, you know. So I said, I think so. But then I asked Pete as an artist, and I said, can you illustrate it? And he said, illustrating for a book is really hard because you have to have the exact characters looking alike and different things. He says it's hard. So I said, okay. Well, as it turned out, we had this target practice at Ganondigan for these Senecas that were um, target shooting, and we had bought these 3D targets, and they were all of animals, and like turkeys and bears and all of that. So one day um, they were out there, and um, I and the net and that was on a Saturday, and on a Sunday no one was there. So I told Angel and Kaylin, let's head out. So they put their ponchos on. <laughs> and we headed out to the woods and um, and I just took a camera because I thought I can take the picture with all of these animals you know and the birds whatever I can get out there which is what we did so we set out on a journey to take these photos and um, and then we ended the journey and um, I have to say the journey didn't end like, a, like with a happy ending that this one has. <laughs> what happened at the end was that after I took the last photo, we were coming around and um, I could hear this bashing, like bam, bam, bam. <laughs> and then these kids like laughing. And so, um, so I, we started to go around the corner and I looked and over there, there were these three or four young teenage boys and they were bashing the um, the targets, mm -hmm. and so so I just looked and I looked at Angel and Kevin and I said, "You wait here," and I said, "I'll be right there. Don't move." And so I went around to them because I knew that they saw me. Also, I saw them look up and go, "Hey," you know, <laughs> and that they saw me. So I had to think, and um, I thought I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be the prey. Um, that if, the, if we had to head back that way, I didn't want them following us. So I, that's why I told Angel and Kaylin to sit, and I would be right back. And I went over there, and I said, what are you guys doing? And I was yelling at them. And, uh, but they hid their hands behind their back. And I said, um, I said, I said, they said nothing. We were just going for a walk. And I said, you liars. And I said, look at the head of their boar is on the ground. And you look at you, I could tell you were bashing it. You know? So they said, well, um, they said, well, no, it just fell off. And I said, what do you have behind your backs? And I said, give, them to, give it to me. And they pulled their hands out, and they each had a machete. So, um, they hit, so and they were big. And so I just said, went over and I said, give those to me. And I took those machetes from them. And then I said, uh, I said, now go on, get out of here. And I said, put that boar's head back on. And I noticed Angel and Kaylin were now with me. <laughs> and I was like, oh boy, you know. So I said, um, put that boar's head back on. And I said, go on. And then and they go, well, when are we going to get our machetes back? <laughs> and I said, you can come to the um, to the brick house, and they'll be there. So, and I said, come on. And then we were kind of walking, and and then um, and then all of a sudden I got nervous. They were like, hey, they're gonna probably think, hey, wait a minute, there was an old lady and two little kids. You know, we can take her. You know, and so I got a little nervous, and luckily I had my cell phone with me, and I called and I asked Pete to meet me, drive out on the lawn, and drive as far as he could, and we would be coming up the back of the hill. And so he said, okay, and he goes, what's going on? And I said, just meet us there. And I said, there's these kids that are out here. And um, so he did that, and when I got there, and he goes, what do you have? 
And I said, Machete. <laughs> he said, where did you get those? And I said, from those teenagers that are out there. He said, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, what is wrong? And I just said, well, I didn't want to be, you know, I really, I didn't want to be in a situation where they were following us. I, you know, I wanted to be more of the predator. <laughs> You know, so I didn't want to be that weak prey. So I said, so I took them from them, and I go, and they're here. <laughs> them. So I said, but we have to get going to the house, you know. So we got to the house and called the police. And the police came up, and um, but on our walk back, I had noticed some things. And um, so when the police got there, they were saying, you know, chances are it's a park. It's a New York State park. We're not going to find these kids, you know. And um, so we don't know what we're going to do. And I said, well, I think I know where they live. Or at least I know where they stopped and started. And they, he, she said, how do you know that? And I said, because as they were walking, they must have been slashing the grass down. And it was high. And so I said, so at that point, um, I said, I noticed where it stopped. And um, so she said, really? And I said, yeah. And I pointed where they came from. And so I said, you could check it out. So she did. And she came back and said, you should be a detective. <laughs> she said, that's where those guys came from, you know. And those were their uncle's machetes. So we ended up, um, uh, we didn't press charges. I said, the, I said, we don't want to press charges. There are neighbors, maybe not very good neighbors, but they're still our neighbors. And also, they, I said, I would look, in order for them to get their machetes back, I want them to come here to get them back because I want to see them too. I want to talk to them. And they did. Only one came with the uncle and we talked to him and then I told him that what I wanted him to do was to, he wanted, I wanted him to do some work on the site. And um, he only came one day when I wanted him more, but he came. And he did some work there, and they got their machetes back, and we never had any problems after that with them. And you know, so it was our final story, <laughs> the real ending of this story. But and um, and Angel and Kaylin were so little. Luckily, that they did not remember that commotion at the end, and they were so young that when last night when we talked about it. I said, do you rem remember anything about the story or anything, you know, and they said, not really. Angel remembered a little bit more than Kaylin did um, about getting photos, but, um, but they were very young. They were four and six, right? And um, so rather than to have them talk about the book today, what I thought I would do is ask them to talk about what it was like for them being uh, growing up at Ganondigan mm -hmm. because at Ganondigan we had at the brick house we had so many people in and out of that house and that that the dining room table that we had there had some very important historic you know I mean just some people that were important to the Iroquois Confederacy that I couldn't give up that table so um, the table now is at the White Corn Project, and it always reminds me of those times at Ganondigan in our dining room where so many important clan mothers and chiefs and leaders sat there talking, you know, and with Pete and, um, and just talking about just um, issues, but also about the, um, you know, what was going to happen with Ganond again to the vision that they saw and um, Pete would talk to them about that. So what I thought was that, and we also, you know, with all the events and everything, we had a lot of um, cool people that came and performed and um, lectured, um, demonstrated their traditional arts or contemporary arts. And um, so I asked Angel and Kaylin if maybe they would be, maybe that's what they should do, is to talk about what it was like to grow up at Ganondigan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Kaylin has to leave here and get back to work. Um, Ganon again, his job. You know, so, um, he, so I thought that I would get them both to come up and we can come up together or separate or whatever. And it's a lot different than sitting over there. <laughs> so, yeah, growing up, um, I'd say it's a little bit different for me, just more so because I was actually born in Canandaigua, whereas Angel was born in Buffalo. So I was really, really raised at Ganundagan from birth, really. Um, nevertheless, we still have the same experiences, more or less. Um, so for me, it was, it was very, you know, more so looking back in time from my perspective now, you, do, you never really realize what you have when you were younger, right? I never realized how significant it was for me to live at Ganondagate and be raised as one of the first um, Seneca children to be raised on that site in 300 plus years, especially now working there. Because um, now working there, I've realized with time, and the reason why I started working there was because I, I quit my job at Chipotle it was kind of, you know, messing with my mind because it was just so much work for nothing. Um, so one day, this new site manager, Michael Galvin, he texted me one day and was like, hey, do you want to come work at Ganon again? And I was like, sure, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, 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 by that point, I had been so far away from Ganon again that I realized how much I missed when I was younger, especially in my teen years. Um, especially because when I got older, I was more interested in video games and like my social life at school that I didn't really go to any events at Canandigan and I realized how much I lost within that time. So now, being uh, an employee there, I can really be there and witness everything that goes on and I can also be a part of it and help run things as well. And it helps me keep that connection that I once had when I was way younger before I was into all of those, those video games and losing those things. Um, because I got to a point where I stopped dancing at the festival uh, every summer. Um, and I've realized now that I miss that greatly. I really do. Um, I don't have any traditional regalia anymore that fits me because I don't have any connections to get some. Um, however my grandmother has offered, I should probably extend that out to her. Um, so, you know, we've, we've met so many, um, so many big names when I was younger and I feel like that really helped with my social development very well because by the time I was 12 or 13 I, we, we were going out to like formal outings, you know, dressing up, meeting adults, talking to adults as a child, you know, so it's like getting that um, maturity really raised up higher than a lot of other people at my school. Um, some some big names I met were like, I, my, we were talking about this last night, we had a, a get together at the site outside in our, our old square tent that we used to have in the middle of the field and um, I actually got to meet Danny Wegman and, and William Mutar. You know, these as a kid these are like people you see on the TV. So for me for me at the time it was a big deal that I met William Mutar because I was always talking about his his commercial. <laughs> the funny part too is that the next day so I shook his hand, we met and he gave me a pen. And so, of course, I was in fourth grade, I take this pen, I took it to school, and I tried to tell everybody, I was like, hey guys, you know, last night I met William Mutar, he gave me this pen, and I just started not believing them, you know, they were like, yeah, right, you know, I kind of got that pen anywhere, but I, I was like, no, hey, seriously, like, I met this guy, and they were like, no, no you didn't, and I was like, okay, fine, I, just, I met William Mutar, um, you know, so there was a lot of different, um, things that I had that not a lot of people had, especially with the culture of learning, really like in the sphere of Victor, there was this sphere really, it felt like this world, this other world where I could learn these things, these cultures without having to be on the reservation and learning from people out there, I still had a location that I could still come to and really call home and I still call it home today because that's what it is for me, it's like it's not just work but I'm working at home and I'm, I'm with still an ongoing family with the other employees there. We feel like we're family as well. Um, and I mean, interestingly enough, like we still have a full indigenous crew, um, whether they're Haudenosaunee or as Michael Galvin is, he's Washoe Paiute. 
And I still don't discredit him for that because he knows the culture. He, he's lived in the culture. His wife is Mohawk. And um, I actually had an experience where somebody came to the site and asked about all of the people who work there and the cultures that are going on. And I, I told them that um, uh, our site manager is Washa Paiu. She was like, well, well, why does, like, how, how did he get that position? He doesn't know. I was like, well, he does. He's been here like 30 plus years, well beyond my time. And he's, you know, been involved in the culture. He's been everywhere. He's been, you know, further out west. He's participated in other ceremonies out there too. So he has all of the credibility to be taking that position. Like, I don't want you to doubt him at all because he's so well read. Um, so we really, we really say that we're open and welcome to anybody working there at the site. Um, and that we don't want to keep it solely closed to Haudenosaunee people because other folks have to learn too. So we want to make sure that everybody can come and learn. Um, but of course, within that culture, we also understand that we want to you know, keep that culture alive and around still in Victor. So we do kind of more so push to keep Haudenosaunee people employed there. But you know, ultimately, we're open to everybody. And that's really what the culture is about. Learning um, through living with Anjanette and Uncle Pete, you started to understand that you know a home can be open to anybody who's willing to learn under you, um, and that it's just not really always about like a parent and kids. It can also be students and teachers within these families. Um, that's how it traditionally works for us, for the, for our culture. I've learned at Kanundagan, within these villages of. 4,500 people on that hilltop um, that not everybody was just a parent and a child. It was also teachers and students. All of these parents were really teaching their kids how to go on through life with keeping a good mind and keeping, um, you know, kind of trying to keep the positives in your mind while all of the negatives are being thrown at you. So it's really where I became who I am today. Anything that's kind of negative, I just switch it around in my head to make sure that it doesn't drag me down all too much, you know, so to keep a balance between the good thoughts and the bad thoughts, to make sure that they really collide to keep yourself well balanced in your own mind. Um, you know, learning all of the simple principles of that with our Gununya, we have at, um, you know, we play it all throughout the day at the site, the, the Thanksgiving address, and we still perform that today as well with great um, bigger groups. Um, for meetings, that we still uphold these things today, and that it's very important that these things are still ongoing, that we keep the traditions of having a multi-generational household like we had at Ganundagan in our house. And I mean, it wasn't just Angel and I with our generations, but they also housed my mother and my father. They met here in Rochester. And, and that's another thing I always tell everybody about is because, you know, I get a lot of people at the site who say, um, you know, in different words, but it's the same gist of like, you know, oh, you know, I feel so terrible for your people because my ancestors way long ago came and destroyed your village or, you know, they came and destroyed the land or they came in and they ruined everything, the government, you know, all of that stuff. But I always tell them, you know, of course, that happened. Right? But that was you know, hundreds of years ago. There's nothing that we can do now about that. Maybe recover some things, but ultimately we can't go back in time and change those things. But also, if none of those things had happened, I wouldn't be here because my father, he's from New Mexico. So that being said, there would, like, if that had never happened, this destruction of the land, what have you, that would have never happened. My parents never would have met. I would either be a different person today or not existing <laughs> at all, you know, so. And same with everybody else in this room. Nobody else would be here either. So I'm just grateful that everybody that can be here and learn about the culture and, you know, kind of learn what we have to offer to the world that they're still here in existence and that they've come and taken their own initiative to learn about us as well. Yeah, so Kale and I have had, um, grew up together at Kanondagan, but we've also had different experiences. 
Um, he's working at the center right now. I work at the White Corn Project, and I'm doing a lot of different things over there. So when I was 13, I got into a little bit of trouble in school, and I, I had to stay out of school for a couple months. And in that time, my aunt had, um, you know, well, my uncle had started talking about bringing the White Corn Project from Cataraugus to Ginondian. So they, they had bought the, the old farmhouse that we're in now, and um, because I couldn't go to school, uh, I didn't really have anything to do. Um, the family didn't really want me at home watching TV and playing video games and just doing whatever. Um, I ended up helping to remodel that farmhouse to bring the project in. And then when I was 14 and the project moved in, I started working there. So I have, and I'm still currently there. So I've been there for, they moved in in 2012. So it's been uh, 11 years now that I've been with the project. And what I always talk about with my presentations is growing up at Ganondagan gave me, a, gave me a completely different experience than other children, and even other indigenous children on the reservations. So whenever I went back home to visit my family and my cousins, um, yeah, I was shamed a lot by my elders because I didn't know my language, and I didn't know my songs, and I didn't know much about the ceremonies because I, I didn't really grow up going to ceremonies. Um, instead, I grew up again on again learning about the history of our people and learning about where where these traditions stemmed from. So, you know, growing up being shamed when I wanted to reconnect to my culture, uh, try to learn my language, try to learn my songs. I didn't feel comfortable going back to my community and asking these people who have shamed me my whole life for not knowing. And growing up at Ganondian, I, I learned you know, where, where we learn these things, and that's the natural world. We've always been told that uh, the natural world is filled with our original teachers. That's the plants, the animals, um, the water, the wind, the sun, the moon. Everything has um, something to teach us. And it, it's all about learning how to be human. So when I decided to reconnect with my culture, with these teachings, I instead decided to uh, connect myself to the natural world. And I began learning about minimalism and sustainability and you know, living a more low-waste lifestyle. And with doing that, I started taking hikes, uh, I started you know, doing these hikes barefoot and really connecting the bottom of my feet to the ground, uh, to the soil, feeling the plants, sitting with the birds and the animals and really just um, spending that time to, to just slow down and not have to focus heavily on you know, society and these things that you read a lot on social medias and Facebook and when you go to school, you're with all these people that have these, um, you know, there's these stereotypes and these things that you should look like and things you should say and ways you should think. Um, otherwise, you're weird and you're not quite normal. And I wasn't growing up. Um, I was very far from normal. At such a young age, uh, I experienced traumatic events and most of my life have been dealing with PTSD. Uh, have had a lot of symptoms and it's affected my relationships with people uh, and mainly relationships with my peers. I had a hard time getting along with people my age and making friends and keeping friends. So really immersing myself in the natural world, um, it taught me a lot of things that I couldn't really learn in school or with my peers. Um, when I, whenever I would go back home and I would spend time with my cousins and I, I wouldn't know my songs or my language, but my cousins would, my family would, these people at Cataraugus would know these things, but they wouldn't quite understand the meaning of them. So they would sing these songs, but they wouldn't understand that they're giving gratitude to, to the strawberries, to, to the natural world, to these animals. They're not appreciating it. They're just they're just singing and not understanding, not feeling it. And 
when I started reconnecting, um, I started to reconnect to myself, and I started to understand what it is these songs and our language are teaching us, and it's they're all reminders to be grateful and mindful of what we're given and these things that are already around us, um, that are given to us from the very beginning. And so that's something I teach at the White Corn Project now, because at the very uh, start of the project, it was very business-based and it was very money-based and it was rushing to get these orders out. It was a very stressful environment to, to get the work done. So after a few years, um, of doing that, I had to take a couple years off from working at the project because I had burned out and everyone had burned out because working with the corn, it's a very labor intensive process. And it's not something you can do by yourself, it's a community based work. And so to have only a handful of people doing it and working five, four days a week, you know, nine to five, everyone was burning out. And so I took two years off, and when I came back, um, I came back as a manager, and we changed the environment. We changed the entire facility. We changed the way that uh, we spoke. We changed our language, um, because a lot of the way we spoke about things was in a very negative, um, negative way. And so, for example, what I talk about a lot is when we're sorting the corn. Originally, our sorting process was good corn and trash corn. And that, that wasn't something I ever felt comfortable with and I, it took me years to realize why. And so now, when, when I came back and changed the sorting process, instead we changed it to what is this corn gonna become? So now we sort it into a bucket that says halt, that's gonna become the halt corn after. Uh, then we have our flour, um, you know, those pieces that look a lot different from you know the majority of the hulled, uh, but are still edible. There's no mold. It still has the same uh, nutrient value. And then we have our bucket for compost because none of this corn is going into the garbage. None of it's going to the landfill. I'm just going to sit and you know it still has its purpose. It's going to go into this compost. It's going to become rich nutrients for the soil, and in return we're going to use it to help grow more corn. And that is such a beautiful process. And my goal with changing the language was, especially with the sorting process, was to talk about it when we had uh, volunteers and then other people who weren't regularly working with us. And when we, when we talk about it while we're working with it, it keeps that in your mind. And it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to be working with that corn and feeling good and having good conversations, enjoying each other's company, while also understanding that um, the life that this corn is going to have and to be able to see where it's going to go and know that it's going to have a beautiful life out of it. And it, it helps to change your own mindset when you're, when you're doing that. So when we work with the corn, we, um, we work with a teaching that um, has been passed down through generations and generations of our people called the good mind. And there are so many different interpretations of the good mind. But for me personally, I talk a lot about energies. So it's the belief that every living thing has energy and we're always sharing it with one another, whether it's person to person, person to plant, animal to plant, people to animals. Um, we're always sharing our energy with one another. And so when you're working with corn, the corn has its energy, you have your energy, and you're sharing it together. So that corn that's going to end up on someone else's table is also sharing that energy that the people who are working with it, um, they're, they're going to be taking that in. And it's a beautiful process to think about these, these good thoughts and these good energies and these, this laughter that you're putting into this corn and you're going to be sharing it with another person and hopefully continue that cycle. So growing up at again gave me a completely different outlook um, from my peers and my community, and that's kind of where it's led me to doing this work, so. Uh, in conclusion, you know, I <laughs> want to say that I 
I'm always amazed when I hear them speak um, about the depth of their thinking and the, you know, how much they have uh, over their lives developed and uh, you know the positive things that they do. Um, I, I feel very, I feel like gratitude that that, that they are uh, someone who I, I know personally and have known for a long time. Um, <clears throat> And I would give most of the credit to Jeanette because Jeanette was the kind of mother who uh, really took the time to deal with each of the individual <coughs> things that were impacting their lives at the time that they were taking place and was the one who would intercede at the school when things were difficult and would go directly with them to try to resolve any of those issues that were affecting how they were doing. And uh, I was busy running good on again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hearing these things secondhand, but um, I could not handle these issues as well as Jeanette. So uh, it's right that uh, she be recognized for that yes. contribution she's made to these children, these young people. Um, they are a great credit, obviously, to uh, Ganond again, to have them now representing us either at the site as an interpreter or as a person who's doing the um, sorting and the processing of our corn. Um, <clears throat> we've been very fortunate in that way. And uh, like Jeanette, also, uh, we feel very fortunate that some of the people who, we, who came and lived with us for a period of time uh, still maintain contact with us and some come and you know spend time at our home and it's always good to see them and they feel like our children and uh, it's always good to hear how they're doing and, and uh, to be able to see their families grow and, and so forth so we've been very very blessed in that way and I want to thank you for this invitation and also thank you for the award done it too. We do have some books back here that Angel will um, be back there shortly to sell. Um, these are, there's not many left. You know the strange thing is? <laughs> is that this book is on, what is that? Amazon. Amazon for like 60 bucks. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but it says that I'm selling it and I'm not. And that's scary to me that. That kind of stuff is out there, you know. But anyways, you can get it for five. <laughs> and the other book that's there is about the Nadis, which happened um, after this book because um, doing collaborations at Ganand again, we worked with Nazareth College and the students because one of the art teachers wanted us to. Um, have a project with them and she didn't know what and I said well we're looking for some books for the gift shop and that kind of thing and but I didn't want them to take a legend an old legend I wanted it to be something more contemporary which kind of um, makes children realize that there are still Seneca kids today and you know could be going to school with you and all of that so the students worked on it but the teacher, the professor there, um, came up with this book, and it's called The Nadi at Ganondigan. And she's also an artist, so she created these little um, stick people, like uh, from things that she would find on the ground, and, they're, and made them into these people, and they're called Nadis. So the sto that story is about kind of past this one and it gets more in depth and it has a real story to it, you know, and um, so that's the Nadi Zakanon again. And I didn't bring the pr um, the prices with me, but I think that that one sells at our gift shop for $20. So um, if you're interested in any books, you know, we would love to have you help us out and, um, and support Ganon again. So, um, you can head back there. And I really appreciate that you invited us. And um, 
if you have any questions or you just want to talk with us, we'll be around here for a little bit, except for Kaylin. Kaylin was supposed to leave a while ago, but he just is enjoying this so much. <laughs> and they both did a great job, didn't they? Okay, so thank you very much. Now that they could, do you have a minute for questions if people have comments? Sure. No questions. We're on. All right. <laughs> Before you, I just want to say, Jeanette, this is this is one of the most powerful programs we've ever had. And I thought, you know, boxes of Kleenex on every table. Because if you don't see me, I'm going. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> Especially when Kaylin and Angel talk. Oh, I know. And it's this like, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. We are just so honored, and, uh, and I'm gonna cry here if I don't. <laughs> so, well, thank you for inviting thank us. You. <coughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Damien did videotape all of this, so it will be available on YouTube if it's okay for yeah. everyone. Yeah. And it's going to really enjoy it in the future. Sounds and pass it on. The, the message is so powerful. Yeah. And maybe we could post it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.